We often begin the meditation with that contrast, the chant on aging, illness, death, separation. The world is swept away, has nothing of its own, offers no shelter. And then, may I be happy. That's to put our search for happiness in context. The world outside doesn't have much to offer. It offers lots of things, but then it takes them away. We have to regard this as normal and universal. It's not happening just to us. The Thai translation for some of those passages where we translate um, subject to aging, illness, and death, they translate it as aging, illness, and death are normal. And in the original sutta where that reflection is found, it's not just I'm subject to these things. The Buddha has to go on to reflect that all beings everywhere are subject to these things. When you think about it, you know, you're subject to them, and it gives rise to a sense of heedfulness. Your actions are the only things that are going to provide happiness. And you look everywhere else around, and the things you could hold on to will slip through your fingers, like trying to hold on to a handful of water. So it focuses your attention on your actions. Your actions are going to make the difference between whether you suffer or not. Then when the Buddha recommends that you extend the reflection out to all beings everywhere, he said that gives rise to the path. In other words, you have to develop the sense of what's called sangweka, just the universality of all this suffering. It's all around us, everybody. We can't see other people suffering. This is one of the main problems of suffering, is it? We feel ours very intently. No one else can feel ours. Sometimes we feel like we're alone in the world. We can tell other people about our suffering, and they can sympathize with it, but they don't experience our suffering. So there's a loneliness that comes with suffering. But when you start reflecting, everybody has their own sufferings. It helps to take away some of the, the sting when it seems like the suffering is being aimed right at us. So it's good to reflect on that for a while. This is everywhere. But there is a way out. The Buddha doesn't leave you there with sangwega, a sense of dismay or even a sense of terror at the universality of suffering. He has you extend goodwill and compassion to all beings. But he says, focus in on your actions, because that's the way out. And this is why belief in karma is an essential part of the path, because it is a path of actions. And the Buddhist teachings show that actions are pretty complex. What you're experiencing right now is a combination of several things. The results of past actions, your current intentions, which are also your current actions, and then the results of your current actions, all these together. That's what you're experiencing. You can't do much about what's coming in from the past, although you can focus on different things or different potentials coming in from the past. Some potentials are skillful to focus on, others are not. In fact, as the Buddha points out, it's what you're doing right now that's going to determine whether you're going to suffer from, say, bad past actions. This is why we focus on the present moment in our meditation, so we can see what we're doing, seeing where it's not skillful, and then taking some advice from the Buddha and the, his noble disciples as to what can be done. So even though bad things can happen, we don't have to suffer from them. When I first went to see Zhang Fuang, I asked him about rebirth. And his first comment was, the Buddha has you believe in one thing. That's the principle of karma, principle of action. 
Now, as it turns out, the principle of action does involve rebirth. Because of the universality of action, its power is such that it's going to it's what has determined what where you're born, a lot of circumstances of your life. that you didn't create in this lifetime. They came from lifetimes before you. And they can also extend into other lifetimes. This is true of you. This is true of everybody else. And it's both reassuring and scary. The reassuring part is that people we've loved, when we leave them or when they leave us, it's not necessarily end, the end of the story. The scary part is we don't know what the conditions are going to be. To say nothing of the future lifetimes, we don't know what the conditions, how the conditions are going to go in this lifetime. What we do know, though, is that the power of the mind is such that we can train it. Once you've accepted that things are uncertain. There is no protector outside. We have to learn how to be our own protectors, and we can do it. That was the Buddhist message. That's what his awakening means in our lives, is it is possible for human beings to find true happiness through their own efforts. It's something we can do. And John Swat used to like to notice that the Buddha keeps talking about how the aggregates are not self and the sense media are not self. He said, but then we have that chant, I'm the owner of my actions. You are responsible for them. They are what you are going to re receive. So you focus your attention there, and you try to develop a sense of yourself as capable of doing the practice, and a person who's responsible. You take responsibility for what you've done, but you take more responsibility for what you can do right now. So everything keeps pointing to, what are you doing right now? In fact, that's one of the questions the Buddha has you ask yourself every day. Days and nights fly past, fly past. What am I becoming right now? And of course, what you become is based on what you're doing. And what you're doing is based on a sense of what your capabilities are. And in this is an area where the Buddha is full of encouragement. We can all develop mindfulness. We can all develop alertness. Our efforts put in to become more skillful are never wasted. So the teachings are there to give us encouragement, in addition to giving us direction. It's often stated that when, when the Buddha would give a Dharma talk, he would rouse, encourage, and inspire his listeners. He wasn't just setting out a few facts about, well, this is what suffering is like, and this is the cause. He gives you encouragement, this is information that's really going to be useful to you. As he said, the things he would say, the things he would teach were one, true, two, beneficial, and three, timely. There are a lot of truths he learned in his awakening that are really irrelevant for us. He didn't teach them, even though they were true. And there were times when he was harsh with his students, and other times when he was gentle. But he was always encouraging. Even the harshness was there for the purpose of encouraging people, reminding them they can do better. This is one thing that's misunderstood a lot when people read the teachings of the Forest of John. Some of them are pretty fierce. Well, they're fierce because they realize their students have capabilities that they're not taking advantage of. And that's one way of reminding them, okay, they can do better. There are other times, though, when you, you need to be encouraged in gentler terms. But either way, the message is encouragement. 
And even when you stumble, it's possible to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and just keep going. So remember, your actions are what are important. And you can make skillful choices now. Now, we can't guarantee that living in this human life, once you've started on the path, everything will be a path of roses. We all have our past karma. The things that come at us in, the, in life come from our past actions. But again, it's what you're doing right now that's going to make all the difference. So you want to focus on what are your capabilities right now? Where are you holding on to things that are making you suffer? This is a, that was the Buddha's definition of suffering. It's not something that's happening to us, it's something that we're doing. When he gave his analysis, he talked about the things we're familiar with. It's the suffering of birth, aging, illness, and death. The, su the suffering of separation from things and people you love. The suffering of having to be with things and people you don't like, not getting what you want. All of these things are familiar to us. We all recognize them as suffering. But then he went on to summarize what do they have in common. He says the five clinging aggregates. And this is where the analysis gets impersonal and gets unfamiliar. And part of the problem is that translation aggregates. There's got to be a better translation. It's just groups of different actions, basically. So we're clinging to certain ways of acting. And clinging itself is a kind of action. And that's where the suffering is. And so we basically got bad habits, but we can change them. And it starts with very simple things, focusing on your breath, learning to get a sense of well-being right here, right now, and learning to appreciate that sense of well-being. because it puts the mind in a position where it can step back from a lot of its clingings. And put and question them. And so what I said, the most important internal quality you can develop as a meditator is something he calls appropriate attention. In other words, asking the right questions of yourself. And the questions come down to what am I doing? Where is it skillful? Where is it unskillful? If it's skillful, how can I maintain it? If it's unskillful, how can I change? Again, the recognition of your, the power of your actions. Wisdom, the Buddha says, starts with the question, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? The wisdom there is that when it, it's through your actions that happiness comes. Two, long-term is possible. And then three, it's better than short term. So the basic principles are not all that difficult. It's simply giving them priority, because the mind has lots of other priorities. And when you give it a priority, it means you put it first, and also you try to bring everything else in line with these questions. And here again, this is where it's difficult, because we have lots of other questions, lots of other desires. But what the Buddha is having you do is take your desire for a genuine happiness and making that paramount. And then asking you to bring everything else in line with that. So the teachings are there all for your good, for your happiness, to encourage you on the path. And the times when you get down, even though the voice that is getting you down may be, seem to be sympathetic, commiserating with your miseries. But that kind of commiseration is not helpful. What's really helpful is the encouragement. You don't have to suffer from this. 
There was once a time when the Buddha was wounded by a stone sliver. Someone tried to kill him. He rolled a rock down the mountain. Fortunately, something caused the rock to shatter before it got to the Buddha. But one of the splinters of the, the rock got into his foot, pierced it all the way through. And so I had to lie down for a while. Mara came and taunted him, called him a lazy bones, moping around. He says, I'm not moping around, I'm extending goodwill to all beings. That's a good start right there when you're, when you're feeling down. Remember that other beings are suffering too, and you don't want their, them to suffer. And that's a good wish to hold in mind. You'd like to see all beings be free from suffering. It reminds you, okay, you're not simply there suffering from your, from your pains and your sorrows. You've got some goodness inside you that you can share. It gives you a sense of wealth. It gives you a sense of competence. And John Lee points out many times, we have lots of potentials both in the body and the mind that we don't take advantage of. When you start getting discouraged, you're, a lot of your potentials just get pushed off to the side, right when you need them. And here the Buddha is reminding you, take that potential you have for goodwill, use that, your potential for mindfulness, your potential for alertness, they're there. Don't abandon them. If you give them some room, give them some encouragement, they'll come in and they'll give you strength right when you need it. So give them a chance. And they're more than repay the effort that you put into developing them.